was one of the founders of Common Man in Cork. Yeah. And a long time after the foundation, um, she was asked the impertinent question, what do the women do anyway? <laughs> and this was, she took umbrage quite rightly at this. Um, but years later, um, a number of other women also took up that umbrage um, and, and acted on it. And those people are the Shandon Area History Group, of which we've got members here today with Anne. And Anne is a member uh, of, the, um, of that group, the Shandon Area History Group. And the result of their umbrage that they um, put into action, as it were, is a book which some of you will, I think, have on your shelves called Ordinary Women in Extraordinary Times. It was published in 2019, I think, uh, and it was published by the group. And it's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily rich and powerful um, uh, revelation of the stories of 11 women, um, Cork women, who took part in the War of Independence and the Civil War uh, in Cork. Um, it includes Mary McSweeney, um, but it also includes um, many other, I suppose, less um, um, high-profile uh, people. There were the Wallace sisters, I remember, who were you know, very low-key but extremely effective. Um, and uh, it tells the stories uh, of these women um, because uh, they, were never, they have never been told until now. They haven't been told until now. So, and is, 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 is a part of that, um, that revolutionary movement, uh, 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 which we, we certainly welcome. And is a member of the Shandon Area History Group. Uh, she's a leading advocate of revolutionary women's stories. Um, many of you would have seen her on television, um, and, and she's a very well-known um, public historian uh, on this topic. Um, she's also the adult ed coordinator at North Press Secondary School in the city and her uh, presentation is going to be the personal price of patriotism. So again I'd like to grant a very warm Kilmurray welcome to Anne Toomey. I do, yeah. Firstly, I just want to say thank you to um, the Kilmory Historic and Archaeological Association for the lovely invite to come back and speak. We were here in 2019 
and um, I suppose I'm a little bit nervous today because it's actually my first talk since then and um, you know so much has happened to us all during that time so I'm very grateful to Deirdre for the phone call and then Deirdre when I hang up hang, uh, after speaking to you the panic started then <laughs> but um, the best bit I suppose about it all is the, is the of things like this is a chance for us to really immerse ourselves in the history of, of that time and of the particular subject that you've chosen and I, I have to comment to you the backdrop here is just magnificent mm -hmm. and like for myself I spent so many years at UCC with uh, doing my undergrad work and my postgrad there going through that, that pathway every day for God knows how many years and now to realise the total historical significance of it is, is something amazing so it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'd also like to thank those who helped me with the research uh, for this particular talk and uh, in particular Deirdre was very very kind of very helpful in the middle of all what they were trying to do to steer me in a few directions. I'd like to thank Connor, Kenny and Claire for their book and tell them that I forgot to ask them is it alright to quote from it but we did buy a couple of copies for the club so I hope that we cover uh, any kind of fees. And actually as we were talking about it Connor there's a lovely photograph of um, Jim Tuff Barry in your book. And Gabriel, you were talking about doing something on the GA in Cork, and there's a man that is worthy of uh, some kind of, you know, uh, insightfulness. Um, a man that my own father trained under for, for a number of years, and as uh, somebody said to me, uh, was one of the most successful trainers of all time, and yet had such an impact as well on, uh, you know, the War of Independence. So it'd be worth following up on top. Um, I also would like to thank my own club, Chandonary History Group for providing a lot of research today and downloading stuff for me and that, as you can gather from my attempts here, I am not great at IT, <laughs> but anyway, um, we struggled through. So um, I suppose the, the, the range that I was given was to come and, I suppose, look at the personal impact of hunger striking on uh, maybe the strikers themselves, but also the families <coughs> and really the personal price of it. And that's kind of, I suppose I started there with a the quote from uh, Terence McSweeney, it's not those that inflict the most, but those that endure the most that will prevail. Uh, now sometimes it's quoted with uh, that will suffer the most, but I took endure for the reason that I felt an awful lot of the families of the, uh, the men, the three that died and then the nine that survived, did, as time went on, really have to endure quite an awful lot. And the experience of the Cork Corner <coughs> Strike, and I, I am using it to embrace Brixton as well, cast long shadows over the family members of all the 12 men, for good and for, for bad. And in some cases, for some of the men that survived, and uh, I would urge you to have a look at Connor and Claire's book, it just really, really shows you that you know, uh, you can be in the spotlight for so long and then once the, uh, that wanes, suddenly you're no longer, you know, part of the story and what happens to you after, really it, it can become quite an inconvenience for some people to deal with or it gets swallowed up in officialdom or if the goalposts have changed in the settlement that has come out in the politics and you're on the wrong side of it by God, what you did before doesn't really come into, um, into the makeup of it at all. And that's what I found most interesting. Uh, and I was very blessed with Nora Perez. They gave me a couple of extra classes off for the, for the last two or three days just to immerse myself in it and do as Prof Lee used to always say to us, put your shoes, put your feet into the shoes of the people you're trying to work with. And you see, um, you get a sense of, of what, what it must have been like. But while they're on the screen there, those, the, the nine men in particular, and I always think, isn't it very sad? It happened to us with Mary Bowles, and it took us um, an exhibition for us to end up finding a photograph of her, that somebody gave us a photograph that one of the lads, Sean Hennessy, we had a photograph for. It's, it's kind of sad there. But it just, um, my son's old copy book, and I'm giggling away to myself because I look, Cahill, tear on here to revision and it was blank, so I just shut it off. What revision you take back then? <laughs> but I just, I just did a quick trawl through what the men uh, experienced and just to, uh, to let you see what, uh, what they did endure after, you know, and it, like we've been looking at the newspaper coverage and the deaths and all of that, but like I'm just interested here. Uh, Michael Burke, 
He suffered from gastric ulcers, stomach issues. He had to go on a milk diet for, more, for a long time. Sean Hennessy was in a delicate state and had to be spoon-fed for months. Joe Kenny had a long recovery struggle and in fact, as we'll see later in, in a bit of the talk, he was unable to go back to any kind of the work, the manual work that he did before. And for him, standing, as um, one of the doctors suggested, standing was a huge issue for him, not just for a couple of months, but for long term. It cast a long shadow on their personal health. Seven had what you call tolerable health, two were really invalids with long standing health complaints. Sean Hennessy was to die suddenly. He was 46, 1947. Michael Bork died in 1953 in a nursing home. He was 55. Joe Kenny was one of the older uh, men, but then he was, as uh, John Bargano said, he was a very old man starting with a strike. He was 45, lad. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Kenny, he was 77 when he died, but it was 1954. But that doesn't account for something that I'm going to show you there later is the problems he encountered getting a pension from the state. And this was a man who had survived 90 days on hunger strike. Michael O'Reilly, he had to have several operations, half his stomach removed on a restricted diet and suffered indifferent health for most of his life. He died in 1965. Mary McSweeney, when she was on the hunger strike in the Civil War, it did affect her health and it certainly affected her heart later, you know, um, and, and, and it put pressure, it puts pressure on the body that it doesn't recover. And the final guy that I thought was really interesting was Chris Upton. He was asked, would you do it again? And he said, I would, but the cause would have to be good. And that's very interesting, what, what implications that sentence means. He died in 1973, January, right, he was 82. I thought he was a bit older, he was 82. And Peter Crowley died in 1963. And there's some of the others there. But just to give you a flavor, just as we're talking about, it's not those that inflict the most, but those that endure the most. This is where, you know, that was for them the personal impact of it. And of course, for the three guys that died, well, obviously, they paid the ultimate price. But what's interesting is the sense that uh, at least I suppose, certainly in Joe Murphy's case, and indeed in Michael Fitzgerald's, they were overshadowed by how uh, the death of the Lord Mayor in the middle of it all took it all over. And that's, that's a big issue as well for their families. Okay, let's hope to God now I press all these yes. things, right? Yes, okay. Now, I, I was trying to figure out how would I start it, how would I get into the feel of it. And on Thursday night I came home from school and then said, I'm after getting tickets for a concert. I thought, I need this in like a hole in the head, but okay, grand and off we went out to Ballancolly to the White Horse Inn. And Ruby Horse had reformed and they were playing there. And it was, it's quite a tight space. I've never been there before and I heard, heard them live just listening to a husband playing them over and over again in the car radio. And uh, that's the deal for me to have Bruce. But anyway, <laughs> but what was really interesting was the atmosphere in the room was electric and it was very emotional. And the band themselves were quite emotional. And the lead singer got very emotional about the fact that this was their first time in nearly 19 months singing live and to an audience. But um, Decky, Decky Lucy, who's one of the, the, gay, the, the great writers in the band, he had produced a number of songs for the occasion, and this was one of them. And as I listened to it, I thought, Decky, those words. So uh, we contacted him, and he very kindly gave me permission to quote the, the song today. He wrote it in relation to Nelson Mandela and others that had inspired him, and that he was thinking about over lockdown. And I thought it was ideal for here as well. So it says, uh, it's called The River. In my weakest hour, in a long forgotten place, oh, I cursed what I believed in, but so would anyone, living under boots, with no mother and no son. Oh, did I not have the meaning? But how, how could anyone? Oh, the river, don't it wind, dearest. Oh, the river, don't it wind, love. No more crooks to fight. Oh, we're just going where the river winds. I'm an ordinary man, and I did not believe <coughs> that I'd give you up for a movement. Oh, how could anyone? So tell me, love, was it worth it in the end? For I have walked the road to freedom and back again. 
Oh, the river, don't it wind, dearest. Oh, the river, don't it wind, love. No more crooks to fight. No, we're just going where the river winds. And I think it's a very powerful piece, the words. I wish I could have sung it for you, but not a whole time. <laughs> My IT is bad, but the singing is worse. But it just sets the, it just sets the scene off. Uh, I'm thinking personally wise, I'm not for a moment doubting their heroism or anything like that, but they must have had questions. The, the pain that they felt, as John so graphically <coughs> described earlier, uh, the conditions that they were to face later. And what I found most painful <coughs> was, again, the way in which our history developed and the splits that came, that impacted on how their history was recorded. And we found the same with, with the women's history as well. So my plan is to have a look at the Maximini uh, family first and how they uh, were impacted by, by their particular experience of the hunger strike. I'm hoping to get to Joe Murphy and Joe Kenny. And John, will you give me uh, the idea when I'm matched when I just play with Is left. that okay? Sure. Is that all right? Thank you. Because I'm not good at typing. <laughs> All right. So um, this, these are just a group of photographs of the McSweeney family. Uh, you have uh, Annie and Mary on the left, and in the centre you have that iconic uh, wedding photograph of um, Muriel and Terence, and then of course the, the young family to, to the right hand side. And of course the photograph in the middle is such an iconic photograph for all sorts of reasons but particularly for the way in which the split comes later here's Richard Mulcahy being turned to McSweeney's best man and as we all know the way the way that split developed what I'm uh, interested in with the McSweeney family is uh, you know their personal experience of the hunger strike place in Brixton because all of a sudden, from it being a personal engagement with their brother, their husband, or their, their, their um, you know, I suppose their, their great friend in their lives, it suddenly became a, a, a huge public campaign, and they were part of that. And their personal grief, which was to last for a long time after, that, I would say a lifetime actually, that was, um, that was almost a byproduct of what, what they had to do, face the media. Now they were using the media themselves to raise awareness of Terence's campaign. But I'm very conscious of the fact that every day for the 74 days, they made an effort to get into that prison and to spend time with him. Not just his sisters or his wife, but also his two brothers, Peter and Sean as well. Um, but the um, non-misogynist in me would be concentrating on the women. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Annie McSweeney is very interesting and she kept a, a rather powerful diary which later um, was written up and typed uh, by my aide uh, Neil Lewis, who was Terence McSweeney's sort of personal assistant and she would, she typed principles of freedom for him later. But the diary makes very harrowing reading. I've just taken a couple of examples of it there. Um, uh, that I, I'll show you those in a minute, but this is her in the school in St. Dieter's and this is uh, the three, Muriel on the left, Mary in the centre and Annie on the right, as they respond to letters that were given to them of support, but also writing letters of support themselves while they were spending their time <coughs> in London at, the, um, at Terence's side. Um, her diary is of this terrible and yet defining moment in the independence underlines the awful trauma that it was for the family concerned. She kept a constant vision at her brother's side, she talks about it, and um, her niece Mara Oak says in her book, she carried the pain of his loss forever, that she always wore a locket with a snip of his hair that she had cut just before he passed away. And it was reported in the newspapers that it was to her that he had uttered his last few sentences before he lapsed into um, you know, unconsciousness. So that must have been a huge and heavy burden for her to carry, and it certainly marked her um, reactions to things. Um, you can see here, I stayed with Terry for some time, and later Muriel <coughs> came. All the time I was there, Terry was unconscious, rambling. And we heard from John this morning about how people's uh, systems deteriorated, and then the mental anguish that began to come. She, she captures this very rawly in her diary. Poor Terry, it was dreadful to see him 
who had been so marvelously keen in his mind, reduced to such a state of mental pain by these torturers. So that you can you can sense her hurt and her anger and her pain for him. And to see a man who was known as an intellectual, as, as his daughter said later of him in later life, and a man who was capable of you know great cultural things and to have his mind go all over the place. Then she recalls, uh, and just to put a little extract there, but in the diary she talks about the fact that they had to be left in every day. They had, then the door would be locked behind them, then they'd go through another door, and then it would be unlocked, they would go, and eventually this whole sense of as if the ceilings and walls were coming in on top of them. And she captures, captures it, she said, none of us, and I think that's a fabulous phrase, none of us, meaning the whole group of them that were there, herself, Muriel, Mary, Sean, Peter, and the others from, from the Irish community that were with them, none of us will ever forget the horror of that place. And see, in that sentence, in a way, sums up uh, the kind of drift I'm going with, is that the personal price of, of the hunger strike is, is summed up in that sentence. You carry it with you all the time. And in a way, it was a question I was asked in school the other day about the treaty and why do they go this way and why do they go that way? It's in that sentence, whichever way people felt uh, that they would back it or they wouldn't back it, <coughs> because none of us will ever forget the horror of, and in particular what they went through. And then when the realization that he caught, that he has passed, and as John said, there are references to they thought he'd gone, then he rallied. And there were hor horrendous examples in her diary of um, being kept outside and they were terrified that they would force him to eat. And of course, in some quarters, this was translated as that they were preventing him from eating. But they know only too well the cost of giving somebody food if they've been too long on, you know, off it. And even flavoured water, anyone will tell you this had a bad gastric setup. The worst thing anyone can give you is flavoured water or, you know, stuff like that in it. And that was what they were afraid of. And then comes the realisation that he has passed. I cannot believe he is dead. I cannot believe he will never again come rushing in in a hurry, because he used to visit them from the school and that. No rest, no peace, no thought of either. You know, so it really just captures for her the impact that um, that, that moment, or that those long moments had. Um, she, she also writes in her diary about Muriel, and I think this is very interesting because as you know later on, and I'm not going into that today, great controversy as to how there were splits between um, the, the sisters and the sister-in-law. But Annie is very, very uh, powerful in her diary about the dignity of Muriel Maxwini at that time. She said, Muriel was served with notice to appear to identify the body. The account of the inquest was fairly accurate, so Annie, is, as I look at the, uh, that, she said, but, and I'm just cutting it, they could not give the dignity of her bearing. I thought then, and shall always think, that Muriel's quiet dignity was just the tribute that Terry would have wished. And that's, that's a, you know, that really puts for me into context the fact that there was all these kind of splits, you know, our families have them. But in her heart, in her core, she recognised that in Muriel at that moment was something that all the rest of them needed. It was this quietness, it was this dignity, and that she was faced with at the, um, you know, not being there when her husband died, then having to go through the, can you give me the body, um, you have to go through, you have to sign this form, no, you have to fill out that form kind of concept. And facing all that indignity or without losing her personal dignity must have taken a great toll on her. And, you know, people wrote afterwards that she had this breakdown and she had that breakdown. I say, how the hell could she not have? Here was a young mother, a young wife, and now she was a very young widow and was going to spend an awful lot of her life really uh, carrying that shadow of what might have been in her, in her life, you know. Uh, and, and as I say, Annie um, <coughs> mentions that. For Mary McSweeney, um, and we could write an awful, awful lot on that, but for me, and uh, we've done some work about Mary in, in our book and later uh, we've given some talks on her, Mary Max really fascinates me because um, 
I suppose, she, you know, uh, people have either black or white views on her, and I hate when people do that to other human beings because we're all in mixes. And she was, you know, described to some, uh, by some people as a virago, and that to me means she was a strong woman that had a brain in her head as she was able to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and as, as John, uh, John Morgan said earlier, uh, and as he put me onto her speeches originally, what an orator. And in actual fact, she was fascinating when she went to America because he mentioned about her being, uh, you know, if they trying to heckle her, she was well able. She was a great teacher in her own right, so she was well trained that way. But she also had the gift of PR. She would never address the Irish, the, you know, there were a lot of Irish Americans as that. She would call them, uh, she almost said, my fellow Americans. But she described them as Americans. Because she was making it clear to them that she was appealing to them as Americans, not as Irish, you know, to, to, for, for their cause and that. But um, she had an exceptionally close bond with Terence. I would say she was actually the mother figure once their own mother died. She came home to look after the family. She was, in many respects, a very modern woman. She came home to rear the children, but also to work. So she was doing what a lot of us are doing today, working mothers at that time. And Terry was really one of the younger in the family, and they, they formed that bond very, very closely. And you can see that um, that bond builds over time, and the support he gets from her is very, is very meaningful and very powerful to him in his life, such as it was in whatever length of time he had. But when it came to the hunger strike, she was, if you like, the strength for him. And that's interpreted sometimes again as that she prevented him from coming off it. I think that's an awful indictment of the love that was between them. I think it was the strength of, of support in that room where he was on a road that he was going and her job was to help him in whatever way she could. Now, that bond meant that she followed him to Brixton, she fought day and night for his rights, it meant that it drew the wrath of the prison uh, authorities down on them, very unlike what we heard about Cork Prison, where they uh, gradually they were allowed to come in and stay at the bedside. Increasingly, as Terence's time went on, the family, one sister after the other, one brother after the other, and Muri found they, that to even get into the prison was such a difficulty. And then their time, they get so far to the door and say, you can't come in away, you'd have to wait. Mm -hmm. We can only imagine what the impact of that must have had on, on all three of them. But for Mary, um, it, it allowed her to, um, you know, I think to firm up her own very strong political views. It allowed her to go to America and cut her own teeth there. And from there on in, she was really uh, forged on a path that uh, was for the Republic, for the Republic, for the Republic, and nothing else but the Republic. And her own niece makes a very astute judgment later, as, as we know in politics, things shift and move. She found herself politically up a cul-de-sac, and she couldn't reverse back out into fear and She just couldn't do that. She was, in that sense, a very principled woman, which uh, kind of blinked her for in that sense, but it did impact on her life. I think she could never break faith with Terry because of that. That's my interpretation of it. No, I'm not throwing any hard uh, things up. But there is a lovely, um, well, I don't know what lovely, but um, what I, was, I think it was John mentioned, um, and I can't be wrong because they're both John's, uh, mentioned um, about uh, the in interference of Bishop Colin in Dennis Barry's funeral. And uh, this went on, there was a, a big kind of campaign in the newspaper and Bishop Colin uh, had access to the examiner and laid out very clearly in theological terms and all of that why uh, he could not give um, a, a mass, a requiem mass to Dennis Barry. But uh, Mary McSweeney, and I think this is powerful, I mean here we are in the 20s and Mary McSweeney is taking up her pen and paper and she is writing to the examiner and says you will afford me the opportunity to respond to the bishop. Now we've all lived in the years when it wasn't always easy to, uh, how, shall, how shall we say, be critical of a bishop? Well, this is what uh, Mary had to say to, um, to the bishop. Now, in his letter, he had referred to Terence McSweeney's hunger strike, he had referred to Terry, he had referred to the fact that he didn't think Mary McSweeney really had any republicanism in her at all, that she came late to the cause, all of this. So I'll just do the little bit where, um, she says, could I... 
Who's shot who? I thought it was blood. I swear to God. My colleagues in the staff room said to me, don't let them mention the mirror that computer. I thought it was after exploding. Anyway, so she says, uh, could anything prove more clearly that the Bishop of Cork is not acting in accordance with Catholic teaching in his treatment of Commandant Dennis Barry? Now I know that's mm -hmm. where I've gone into the Civil War. Then the fact that all he says about hunger striking in this statement, if it is true today, it must have been equally true three years ago when he officiated with all the honour that the church can pay to a faithful son at the obsequies of another hunger striker, mm -hmm. who was of course Terence McSweeney. And that his conduct towards Co Commandant Barry, if it is justified by the laws of the church in Cork, should have been equally applicable in Mallow, in the case of Andrew Sullivan, and in Dublin in the same case. And might I also suggest to his lordship the propriety, at least, of using Terence McSweeney's name in full when he writes of him in future, and of leaving the familiar diminutive to those of us who loved him, who believed in his sincerity and the cause for which he died. Wouldn't you love to have a little like that? <laughs> so, it, it, I, and in that sense, uh, what I'd say in terms of Mary McSweeney and she, I'm looking at the other two more today, she did, I think, it was like that poem, if ye break faith with us who have died, what have we died for? I think that did firm her in the pathway where she was going and she would not come off it, you know, one way or the other. In that sense, that was her, well, we call it her hunger strike, and that's where her political values. The, you've seen all these images already. The reason I put them up there was, again, this is the public face of Terence McSweeney's funeral. And we, we, we uh, you know, we gasp at all, at all the numbers and the path they fill raised. But in there are family members. In there is a young widow, uh, you know, and there's a young orphaned child, uh, well, uh, fatherless child in that sense somewhere, not at the funeral, but you know, so there is a family impact on that. And it's this one up here on the left that takes my fancy. This is in Cove, thousands upon thousands lined the keys in Cove when the body was being brought back. But their function was to hold it up so that the family who were, you know, the, the body was taken from them in a different direction and they had to go to Dublin and the corpse was gone to Cork. It was most unseemly and it added to the whole horror of the time for them and Muriel herself had become very ill at this stage. So there's a huge personal uh, impact on the family. Um, this is a, an old photograph later on in life of, Mir of Mary and Annie in their schoolroom sitting there. And you can see, even in Annie's case, the toll life has taken on them at that stage. You know, in the, it's in the um, early 40s, late 30s, early 40s, that photograph. Um, this then for Muriel and Terence, and I look at Muriel now. Um, the impact on Muriel was, it was a short life lived together. But for me, it had a lifetime legacy for both her and for her, for her little daughter, for Moira Oak. Uh, in that, you know, she was the uh, Lord Mayor of Cork's widow all the way through. And the fact that um, she finally heads to the continent in the mid-twenties after the Civil War doesn't surprise me one bit at all. Because it's like putting a distance between her and having been in the fulcrum of that, uh, you know, that whole publicity and uh, all of that that was demanded of her as Terence McSweeney's widow. Um, now there are all of the reasons for that as well, and health reasons, and you know, changing her life and all of that. But that's an issue that I think uh, she's not being treated fairly for for that in, in one sense. I, I also just think when you look at um, you know the photographs of them together, it's so poignant because it is so brief. Even when he was alive, most of his time was in and out of prison. Even when she was expecting more, oh, she had to travel to uh, different places to see him, and when she was born, up to Belfast with her, with the baby. So there was a devotion between them, but it was a very tough call uh, and ask on, on the young uh, Muriel. But what people uh, find about Muriel is that, uh, and I've discovered that in the last uh, couple of years that we've been working on, on stuff, is that 
She has really been pushed to the side in terms of Irish history, and she was an amazing woman in her own right, and her contact with Terence McSweeney and the McSweeney family, and others around that cause, helped form her too. Yes, it took her in a different direction politically eventually, but that helped her form her opinions, and she drew strength from that. She found her voice in a world where it wasn't always easy to be a woman and a woman on your own as such at that time. Um, in America, if you look at this uh, photograph here, um, she was asked soon after Terence had died uh, to go to America by De Valera. She didn't want to go. She says it herself. It's probably in the next slide there. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to go, she said. I just didn't want to go. I was too tired. I was too ill. I didn't want to go. But they came under severe pressure to go to America in order to you know, keep the spotlight on Irish affairs. And of course, the American, uh, <coughs> House of, uh, the American Commission was about to be set up and all of that. So they were under pressure to bring that kind of tragedy with them, if you like, into the world's media spotlight. And she says herself, uh, in her own words, I asked my sister-in-law to accompany me. She asked Mary to accompany her. The sense of, um, you know, that she was a formidable person with her that would give her, give her strength. But actually, she said, I was terribly ill all the way over to America. You know, nobody makes allowances for anything like that. She was comfortable travelling, but she was a very unwell person as well. After all that they'd been through, not surprising. And then the last phrase, we were besieged by journalists. Besieged by journalists. Which was, you know, getting off the boat when she, as she looked down, all the keys were lined with thousands of people. And they actually had to send out the New York Police Department to get them off the ship and fight, wave a pathway to get them to, to wherever they were staying and then the speeches that they had to make and the interviews that they had. And it's later when she's in the um, commission, she says, I was dreading this. I was dreading this, she said. But you know, it's not so bad. Maybe it was the chance it gave her to just speak it all out of her system, but she was actually dreading it. And nobody made allowances for that because they didn't have time. Get out there and get, get the spotlight on you. And it had a huge impact on her. And it's not surprising that by 1923, you see her heading off to Germany to a health spa to get, um, to get help, to get well. Uh, and I suppose in, me in mental terms to process it all and to calm down, you know, in that way. And again, that was looked on as something um, unacceptable. I mean, we're much more comfortable with understanding that. Uh, you know, as somebody said, if you broke your leg, would you not get it fixed? If your spirit is broken, would you not get right time to heal it? We accept that now, but in those days, we didn't. And that was a huge impact on, and had a huge impact on Muriel McSweeney's line. And I just had an, a, an extract from her, um, from her witness statement that she made uh, to the um, to the the Bureau of Military Archives, and in it, um, just to to show you what she says. Um, yeah. Um, that was that was very sorry. I'll be caught on the time the creek breaks to me. There it was. Yes, sorry, I've marked on. Sorry, mistake. Okay. I was invited to Washington, D.C. by the editors of the New York Nation. I did not want to go to America at all, and naturally not at such a time. However, various Irish people in London said I ought to go. So I wrote to Arthur Griffith, and he sent me a wire urge you to go. This was a polite command. So it wasn't a request, it was a polite command in that sense. Um, I thought that I had better choose my sister-in-law, Miss McSweeney, as my companion. We went from Cove. I was terribly ill all the way over. On arriving at New York, we were besieged by journalists before landing. Fortunately, Art O'Brien had taught me how to be interviewed in London but I had not yet the experience of being interviewed by 20 together. So you, you get the sense of, um, of how she was a little bit overwhelmed by that, and that's not surprising. Okay. So. 
Um, the legacy of Charles's hunger strike for the McSweeney family, as I said, was a long and everlasting one. For Annie and Mary, it was something they carried with them to the day. Initially, to the, they, they died with Annie, uh, with the lock of hair around her neck, with Mary, I think somewhere in here, um, the Republic, the Republic, as ter you know, when he said um, in one of his more, uh, I suppose, delirious moments, have we got the Republic yet? And that stuck with them. But for, uh, for Muriel, it was uh, finding a pathway in life which wasn't always easy. And her second relationship with Pierre Pan, he ended up being in a concentration camp where he eventually died later from the, the malnutrition that they suffered. So, you know, how unlucky can you get in life that way? And equally, her, uh, her social conscience marks her out as somebody that is not comfortable uh, to be around in, in the Ireland of the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s, where she's asking questions about the role of the church in society, about uh, the mother and baby homes, long before any of us ever asked those questions, you know, and she wasn't liked for it. Uh, for Moira Oak, uh, just a little bit from her book that I think just sums it up really, uh, unconscious of the fact that um, you know her family are here, but I'm just wondering what it must have been like. She says, it is a strange way to get to know one's father, but my father has been revealed to me bit by bit, gradually over the years. So it's, it's stories, it's mementos, it's um, you know people's memories that brought her father back to her, the father that she barely knew. So it's, 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 it must have been very hard that way to, uh, as she said, a strange way to get to know one's father. She says herself um, that history robbed me of my father. And that's a very interesting quote. It's not that she was criticising what she did, but she was just saying, that was the impact on me. I lost my father to history. And she also says here, um, I sometimes wonder if our two fathers played any role in our destiny. Rory's, who was Carl's Rua, of course, and mine. I feel I am still influenced by those two men who dedicated themselves and their lives to their service of their country. And for their part, they would have been very concerned for our welfare. I certainly believe that my father kept an eye on me during the uncertain years of my childhood. It is a feeling that I have still. That's a powerful thing to say about someone that's the absent more from your life than actually being present in. But to have had that, that sense that someone is with you all that time. And that's the shadow that the hunger strike cast on, in that sense, uh, the legacy of it on, on, um, on Moira Oak. Okay, so now, John Murphy, how am I doing? Five minutes. Five minutes? Oh, <laughs> so Joe Murphy, when I, I suppose with Joe Murphy, I was very lucky that um, his grandniece, um, his, uh, his grandniece um, um, Shirley, I made contact with her, and she was just—I I could have missed her forever. She was just fantastic about him and about trying to get, you know, information about him and all of that. But basically, what I wanted to focus on here is. Um, that's, you've all kind of looked at that, that he was born in America, came back to Ireland, lived on the Polydorf Road, that's the house there which has the plaque on it, and then uh, that didn't happen until the 1950s, and then later the road became um, Joe Murphy Road. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, man after my own heart, big into hurling and football, he played with St. Plunkett, and he was a Cork County Council worker. But his family were market gardeners out of Polydorf, and that's what his father did for a living. But he helped him because he had a horse and cart with the council. And the idea was he actually did most of the manual work. They were a large family, but he was, he was uh, in the upper end of it, so he did a lot of the work for them. In 1917, he joined the volunteers, and he was very active. But in 1920, he was arrested at home, and it was about 3 a.m. And from July until October, he spent his days in Cork J, which you've uh, accounted for um, today. Now, his hunger strike really um, is referred to in family as that it, it demanded of him a willpower of steel, that he was in dreadful pain, that the strike in Cork uh, was drawing huge attention, and then Terence McSweeney was moved on to, to Brixton. 
But in September to October, there was a huge decline in Joe Murphy and, and in the others. For Joe, uh, what kept him going was his visits from his parents, Tim and Nora. It was quite harrowing recounts of those visits and his siblings. The one he wanted most was his brother Richard. Um, there was, they were very close. Richard was, was uh, one of a twin, but Richard and uh, Joe were very, very close. But Richard had joined the Merchant Navy, and there was a little bit of tension over that, but then he wanted to see Richard. And family got word to Richard to, that he needed to get home. And he landed in Belfast. Uh, Richard had American citizenship. He was arrested in Belfast when they realized the connection with Joe Murphy. And uh, the American consul came to intervene on his behalf, and the deal was that he would have to leave. He would be freed from Belfast, but he would have to get on a ship straight away and be deported to America. So he never, ever saw uh, Joe Murphy, who waited for him. And none, uh, neither um, mother or father, Nora or Tim, ever saw Richard again. He went to America. To this day, he has um, grandnieces and nephews who have made contact, Shirley was telling me, with the family. And they always, on Patrick's Day, fly the flag and on the uh, anniversary of the hunger strike we light a candle too because they said their father carried, well he would have been their great grandfather, carried the pain of not seeing his brother all his life and that he got to America but that was the, that was the deal that was done and it was put to him that if he didn't go that the family would lose two sons, not one. But Nora Murphy always said, I lost not one son, but two sons because of the hunger strike. And he's never mentioned about that. Um, his mother uh, stayed with him all through. She was allowed through the nights to him, ministering water to him, holding his hand. And uh, there was this medal between the miraculous medal um, that she used to press into his hand and they would hold it together. And he would keep asking, is Richard coming? Is Richard coming? Um, the death of Michael Fitzgerald was a huge blow to him and really uh, it's only just sheer will that keeps him holding on. He dies on October the 25th with huge crowds on the side. Now what is horrendous uh, from this is uh, what happens with his pension and it is really just... Um, <laughs> I was so angry last night reading both his and Joe Kelly's attempts to get at their pensions. Uh, in Joe Murphy's case, because he was dead, it had to be his, his uh, you know, the, the, his mother or father had to apply for it. And his father attempts to apply for it, but they feel that he can still work. And that, um, you know, what was the point of applying for it and all of that. So in the end, he gets a gratuity payment after so much interference on his behalf. Uh, by different TDs and different uh, IRA commanders who have known Joe Murphy, and pointing out the sacrifice that this guy has made. But in one letter in particular from an army commandant at the time, I'll just move forward there. You won't see it, but I'll go close and read it. Uh, the applicant is a strong supporter, this is Tim Murphy, his father, of the irregular organisation. I would not recommend payment of pension in this case, as all of the family are of irregular sympathies. And that was in 1924 there. That's the full army response, but that's just the line that means the Mall Street. And so in the end, William Cosgrave, president uh, in, uh, of, of the executive, intervenes and, you know, wheeling a deal is done, and a gratuity, once off payment, of £75 is paid to Tim Murphy. Mm -hmm. Now, he accepts that, and that's the problem for all the time through. Every time the family reapplied, particularly Nora Murphy, who's once Tim dies, she's really left. Uh, two sons are gone, the son in America, uh, Joe is gone, and now the husband is dead. She's relying on the daughters to marry and get the sons into the business to keep the business going and the need for the pension becomes greater for her. And she pours her heart out in letters about what my son did and how he died of hunger strike and so many days he spent on hunger strike and all of that and it keeps coming back to you got a gratuity of £75 and that was it. And, and the family, uh, Shirley told me, they had to fight for his War of Independence medal and they finally got it in 2019. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, this is just a little extract from Nora's letter. Um, uh, and after 76 days, he died on the 25th of October 1920. My son was a terrible loss to me. As at that time he was uh, arrested, he was earning as much as five guineas uh, per week uh, and more than his father through his, um, through his death died. And his father, through his death, died of a broken heart. So Shirley says that the father was never the same again. Uh, which was also a terrible loss to me. I also have another son who was arrested in Belfast when coming from America to take, uh, to take his place and uh, was interned in Crumlin Road Jail and so on and then something about water and all that. It's all been a terrible master. And you feel, I actually felt um, in, not so much as embarrassed as, oh my gosh, this is, this is this woman's personal life poured out of this paper about um, I need the money for and you just feel, oh my god, you know what they had to go through to and she still didn't get it. It was um, denied all the time to her. This is Joe Kenny and I feel, I'll, I'll, if I can just have indulgence for Joe Kenny, would that be alright with people? Yeah. Joe Kenny, he was born in 1877 and he died in May 1954 and I'm grateful to Connor's book which we bought two copies of, <laughs> Connor, to, to use this information from. Uh, his home was really a meeting centre for the IRA. The reason I'm showing this now is, you'll ex uh, I'll explain in a minute. He was involved in the ambush of the Blarney RIC station, not to take arms, but to do the diversions and the roadblocks and all of that. They came under fire for that. Uh, as John was telling me earlier, he was a source of ammunition for the company. He manufactured uh, little bullets, fillings for cartridges, everything. Uh, he was doing that all the time when they were, you know, getting tight on ammunition. He was in contact with Terence McSweeney for the Doyle loan. Uh, in Cork, he met Terence on a weekly basis, and he was also Terence's man on the Sinn Féin arbitration courts. He would follow along with all of those. He was married with seven children while he was involved, and there was another one on the way in 1920, when he was arrested, and that child was born uh, a girl, but he was on hunger strike. So he was typically considered the oldest not a very old man, John Borgonova. He was the oldest of the hunger strikers. He was only 45. And he, um, 90, some say 90, 94 days. But he lasted that length of time on hunger strike. The reason I'm bringing all of that there is that he, um, after he came off the strike, he had to be in a hospital for a while. Then he was transferred to Spike Island. And then he was transferred to Bear Island. Um, during the, the um, Civil War. So he was in a long term in prison and he faced great stomach issues, digestion, standing for long periods was a huge issue. He had huge problems with his pension application. It was turned down in 1923 and turned down repeatedly. He finally received his pension in 1947 and he died in 1954 and he received no disability allowance. Yeah. And it was because, it's a common thing, he was on the wrong side when uh, the initial pensions were being applied. Then later, there was huge hardship on his family while he was in prison. When he came out, he couldn't return to the building work. He applied for a job in, as a rate collector with Cork uh, City County Council. And there's a lovely record, he actually got someone to handwrite into the pensions for what they said about him at the council meeting because there was another guy going forward for it, Sean O'Sullivan, an alderman, he should have got the job and he, when he realised that um, Joe Kenny was putting his name forward, he didn't know that, he stood down and he said, no way, this man has done so much for, for all of us, he said, I would, it would be an honour that he would get the job. And Kenny always felt it for him that Sullivan stood back and left him have the job in days when jobs weren't easy to come by. But he had to put that letter into his pension application and it was still turned down. Later, Flory O'Donoghue, who was the key intelligence officer of the IRA in Cork, he said of Joe in 1939 in a letter to the Pensions Board, it is that he is alive at all is little short of a miracle and certainly few men today have suffered more in their service to the nation he deserves special consideration. 
this is the reason for this. This is a question and answer thing that you need to go through. And uh, it reminds any of us that have had awful experiences of, of stupid interviews. And you find the person who gets the job after you think, really, really, was I that bad? But in the interview, listen to this. I see you did 90 days hunger strike. Is that right? <laughs> I did two periods on it myself. I was for a week myself or five days. I went on strike. I was sent to hospital. Then there was an order from the brigade preventing me from going on strike because my head was not very good at the time. So your statement is wrong. You say you went on hunger strike in Cork jail for 90 days. Yes, when the main body went on strike, I joined them, but they were four days on it when I joined it because I was recovering from treatment at the start. By the time I was reading through this, I was spitting fire. I was being offered a cup of tea at that stage because I quite believe it. But you did go on the big hunger strike afterwards. Yes, on the 15th of August, I think it started. There were four days on it then, and this is the first time I got permission to join. <coughs> so the whole period was 90 days. Back again. Yeah, 90 days was my term. You told me you were not on hunger strike for 90 days. This is the way this was going on, and it goes all the way down over how many days you were on the hunger strike. Not that the fact that he had been on the hunger strike and that he couldn't prove it, couldn't have documentation to show it. He's turned down in 1940. Former comrades appeal on his behalf. 1945, he appeals again. And in 1946, he's awarded. They work out how many years he actually did, and they, they figure out one and a half here, two and a half there. I'm reminded of a granduncle who had asked, why are you applying for these glasses? Because I am blind. <laughs> <laughs> he was awarded for, they worked it out that he had three years service, and they gave him 15 pounds of a pension. That was it. It is scarcely just, in my opinion, this was the brigade commandant that he would have served under Tom O'Connell, and to be fair, an army commandant of the National Army during the war, Second World War, said something even stronger. It is scarcely just, in my opinion, to reject the claims of this man for recognition of his services under the Pension Act. And as I say, he, he finally got it. Uh, I'll skip that one, lads. I'm sorry about Donal, but Donal's pension was appalling as well. He never got it. His mother and father tried to apply for it, but I've run out of time. I just want to leave it with this. It's a lovely poem by Catherine Tynan, and it's to the nine men who survived and the three who didn't, and to the families, the spirit of what they must have experienced. You were part of our green country, of the grey hills and the quiet places, but they are not the same now the fields and the mountains, without the lost and beloved faces. And now you too, who were once a part of this sweet country. For there is something lost. There is something lonely. The birds are singing. The streams are calling. The sun's the same, and the wind is in the meadows. But over your grave now, the shadows are falling. You are missing, and all is lonely. And that's, that's all. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, everybody, again, for, for um, staying with us. Um, I'd like to afford maybe an opportunity for a couple of questions. Um, and then we, we, we'll wrap up. We have a little presentation to make before we wrap up. But f uh, questions for Gabriel and for Anne arising from their presentations. Very, very happy to facilitate those if anybody has an observation or a comment or a, a question. Please feel free to, to raise Just your if, hand. Um, if, do you think that the press would have been as intense if Clarence had never moved to London? If he stayed in if he stayed in Cork, do you think it was still... I, I don't think it would have attracted as much of attention. Of course, his office as Lord Mayor, following on the death of Thomas McCartan, generated a deal of attention even before he had moved. But I think the fact that this drama is played out in the centre of empire, you have the symbolism of one man undertaking a lonely struggle against it. the might of the empire in, in the citadel where the empire should have been told in the centre of empire. That was probably 
from this point of view, which is very, very uh, valid from the <coughs> mm. Sorry, can I just ask, um, why do you think you know, um, America, Georgia, and the, the America, so the, there's America, the, the WASP influence yeah. was very, very strong. Yeah. Uh, and in those days, the Democratic Party, which ran Boys, Georgia, but I've forgotten Boys. Well, Boys, Boys, Anglo Saxon. Yeah. Uh, and the Democratic Party, which ran in Georgia, was the party of the Ku Klux Klan and virulently oh, right, right. anti Catholic, virulently yeah. anti Irish. Uh, right. The Irish who lived in, in the American South then. Uh, had a real hard time. There was also a domestic aspect, which is <coughs> the, the Irish question had bedeviled Woodrow Wilson at the Versailles conference. Woodrow Wilson was the American president, he was a Democrat. Yeah. Because the Irish question wasn't addressed at Versailles. The Irish in the Democratic Party in the North. After the first world war? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, yeah. The, in, in New York, Tammany Hall, in Boston, and Chicago. Yeah made Wilson's life hell. And they voted against their representatives, voted against the Versailles Treaty in Congress. So the American Congress never ratified the Versailles Treaty with, with a section of the Irish section of the Democratic Party being the, the crucial factor in Wilson's defeat. And Wilson's power base, particularly <coughs> in the South of the American Democrat, that was the power base, never forgave the Irish. And never forget, never forget the Irish Republicans. Trump would have had a great time. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, in those days, so the, the, the polarities to a large extent have been reversed. We, uh, we yeah, yeah, that yeah. the Democrats are, are weak in the American side, and the Republicans are stronger. In those days, it was the opposite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Question or comment, John? Uh, just uh, referring to my news there, I suppose that. Um, when I was looking at trying to find out about the later lives of the hunger strikers, now this was before the pension statements were, were released, <laughs> Connor had singularly bad timing in, in launching the book because that was actually the, the same week that uh, pension claims uh, went public. But I, I was doing a newspaper search uh, for obituaries. I said, my God, 94 days of hunger strike. You know, it'll be all over the papers about him. Not a word, hardly. One interview with Christopher Upton, um, who at that stage was, was there were only two survivors, uh, and referred to as well. Uh, a couple of lines on Sean Hennessy, blank for everyone else. There was no obituary, uh, just simply death notices in the papers, and that was it. No reference to the, uh, the heroic hunger strike. So they were very modest men, and they didn't, you know, they kept it quiet about themselves. And I suppose it's wonderful today that we can come along and talk about it and uh, make it known just what they went through. Thanks, John. I think in a very real way, this event has actually helped to shine new light, illuminate um, the issue. And, and, and I just didn't get a chance to just thank you for your presentation. It was extremely moving and, and, and you know, a perspective that sometimes history forgets about. We tend to think of documented reality. Um, not the uh, lived reality and the, the collateral impact uh, on, on families. And so so that, that was wonderful. Uh, uh, I think finally, if I can just say before I over to Deirdre, that um, thank you all. Thank the four speakers who have been absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and again, I think Kilmore Museum has been a prism through which we can look at history in a fascinating way. This weekend, has been uh, another one which has added another dimension to the Terence McSweeney story, and hopefully there will be more. Um, so thank you all, thanks to the speakers, and I think now Deirdre wants to close. <laughs> thank you. I shall be quick, because I know you want to get off. Um, but I wanted to say one thing, and that is the work we've done in the exhibition we regard as a starting point. And we very much hope that if people have more information that we don't have, they'll come knocking on the door and say, how about this? Um, I can't tell you the size of the database we've acquired uh, in, the, in the course of doing the research on this. But we w in the book I have had to select some stories, we have more information, so we may have information on relatives of yours, if you are interested, 
the person Anne was going to talk about I actually has covered a chunk in, in the book about that. <laughs> but, you know, we have identified by name 100, uh, sorry, 97 men who were on this hunger strike for some period of time or another. And although we have now spoken quite a bit about the three who died and the nine who survived, for those who were on the hunger strike for shorter periods of time, uh, a kind of an underlying story that emerged very strongly is that three things tended to converge. If you were on the hunger strike for a period of time, your strength was diminished by even quite a short hunger strike. If you were eventually brought to trial, the chances of you not being convicted were almost nil because the combination of not recognizing the court and not being represented at court meant that the evidence against you was unchallenged. Therefore, the evidence provided by the RIC or the military was almost always accepted by the court and therefore you were convicted and sentenced. And partly because of the sheer numbers in prisons in, in, in prison in Ireland, a huge number were shipped over to England to serve their sentence. And you have seen in the course of the lectures today how important it was for your family members and friends to be able to advocate for you. That was impossible if you were in a random prison in England. You were invisible. You were invisible to the press. This is just a personal opinion. I don't think the IRA leadership at the time was sufficiently aware of the impact this was having on them, and the long-term impact this was having them, on them. So there is a, there's a big backstory to quite a lot of these men. So even ones who were perhaps on hunger strike for two or three weeks, you were then, for a start, you would have been sh largely shipped over to the UK and brought back to face your court martial. You weren't treated very nicely on the boat, in either direction, you then went back to serve typically a year or two in prison as a Republican prisoner where the tradition amongst Republican prisoners was to not cooperate with the prison service. So you were facing into confrontation by and large for those. Have a look at things like uh, the board on the Republican families there, where we talk at some length about we compare two families. One is a family that had several long-term hunger strikers on it, the Crowleys, and from Valley Landers, and the other is a family called O'Brien from Liz Carroll, and we have, a, we have descendants of the O'Briens here today. But there was one way or another. Each of those families had several songs <coughs> caught up in this hunger strike. Not always on the hunger strike, though there were a number on the hunger strike, but caught up in it. But the long-term impacts on their families are just enormous. So please don't think this is the last word on it. I regard this is the first word on it. <laughs> so if people had more information, please tell us. But as this, we, we committed to do three Terence McSweeney weekends in the run-up to the centenary. So this is the last of that series. We're not quite sure what will happen next, but throughout the McSweeney Brewer family have been enormously supportive. So we have commissioned a portrait of Charles McSweeney when he was older, and we'd like to present it to you, Carl. Mm -hmm. I've been saying earlier today that this, this should be on television. <laughs> Everything's been amazing. Um, I'm quite overcome. We've had four fantastic talks. You're such a great leader. Uh, so I want to just, um, let's say, uh, allow me to have a little, take a little uh, privilege and do what I want to do, and to give you a hug. <laughs>